So, yes, I'm Aaron Presnell. Um, I think we can just do first names here. Let's keep it, uh, um, this is easy and casual. The, the idea is, is not for us to talk a lot, uh, but rather for you guys to really lead the conversation. We want to hear your questions. We're here to serve you. Uh, there's a lot of experience and wisdom here uh, on, on the panel, but, uh, but this room is full of experience and wisdom as well. Uh, and we're interested in what your challenges are and how maybe we could uh, help you think through some of them and, uh, and hopefully we'll learn something along the way uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, Nicole is, is uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, now uh, working with uh, civic education at, at Facebook. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was working with uh, civic engagement uh, at Facebook. So she's had uh, an interesting uh, balance of experience both on the product development side, um, but now also on sort of the real outreach and, uh, um, and, and empowerment side, if you like, of, uh, of Facebook. Uh, Pia is uh, um, a, a serial uh, social entrepreneur and social engineer. Um, she is uh, um, co-founder of, uh, of two really interesting uh, um, open civic uh, um, initiatives, um, but uh, interestingly enough, at the same time, she's also a co-founder of a political party, um, which uh, she established in, in Argentina um, out of frustration with uh, the, uh, her failed efforts at, uh, at getting uh, um, the establishment political parties in Argentina to uh, engage uh, at the level that she was looking for with their constituents as, as they proceeded with decision making. Um, Doug has uh, got uh, 20 years of experience with um, the, if you like, the investment side almost of, uh, of uh, digital technology and, uh, and, uh, and civic empowerment um, in the United States um, and, and abroad. Um, he's uh, um, most recently in terms of his sort of, uh, formal role is, has uh, served as vice president um, and director for the Center on the Constitution at Montpellier. So here you probably have seen or maybe even visited, heard about uh, Monticello, that's Jefferson's home. Uh, um, he was the guy in the American Revolution with the big crazy ideas, mm. right? Montpellier was the home of Madison. Um, he was Jefferson's sidekick. He was the guy, he was the operator, right? <laughs> he, he, uh, um, he was the one who actually made those crazy ideas uh, um, into something real, and was the primary author of the Constitution, and, and that's uh, what that, that center was all about. Um, so, do you want to get us started? I think what we'll do is with each of the panelists, just give them like five minutes to kind of introduce themselves a little bit uh, better than I could, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, give their first, sort of first thoughts, um, but then hand it over to you guys and, uh, and see where we go. So. Cool, can you guys hear me? Yes, I think so, okay, dope. Uh, my name is Nicole. And I am primarily here to serve you some sleeves. Um, <laughs> but I also work at uh, Facebook. I'm on a team there called Education Partnerships. Um, and I lead our civic education uh, partnership efforts. Um, and a lot of what this means is working with experts and working with nonprofits and different organizations that are working to improve the way that civic education is taught in schools. Uh, how many of you like remember, uh, I mean, how many of you are in high school? Okay, no, no. So how many of you remember like your civics class in high school and what you learned? That's really good because I don't remember a thing <laughs> I learned in my civics class. Um, and uh, that's because oftentimes in, our, in, in schools today, you're taught maybe like, the three branches of government, or if you're from another place, maybe some history, but you don't leave feeling like you have a sense of agency or like you know how to actually change things in your community and impact the world. And if you do, if you did get that out of your civics class, then you're very lucky and that is amazing and I'm happy for you. But a lot of us don't get that, and so uh, we're working on uh, building capacity with organizations uh, that are working to figure out like how do we make civics more actionable in schools and a lot of you might be asking like why does Facebook even care about this um, and the reason is because you know we've uh, for better or for worse we've changed the way that people engage civically every day right it used to be that people you know select few would gather in a town hall and or in a town square and talk about the issues that were happening in their community and then um, go and do something about it. Now that no longer happens, and a lot of those conversations are happening on our platforms, uh, on social media, not just Facebook and Instagram, but also Twitter and Snapchat and a bunch of other um, social medias. 
And uh, we feel, and I specifically feel, a deep sense of responsibility uh, to help the education system and to help just young people uh, be educated on how to use our platforms for good. Uh, because we all know that they can be used for really not great things. Um, and so a lot of the work we're doing is figuring out like how do we uh, teach digital literacy? How do we empower young people like you guys to use our platforms uh, to elevate your voices um, so that you can have a say in decision making tables and a say with elected leaders and what they're discussing? And prior to this, I was a part of a product team at Facebook. Um, it was called the Civic Engagement Product Team. And a lot of what we did was figure out how do we um, build products to help people have a voice in government. Mm -hmm. So we built, you know, one of the things we realized, and what's interesting is that a lot of this just came out of watching user behaviors on our platform. So like a lot of people were tagging their elected officials. A lot of people, when something happened in the news, they were going to Facebook and saying like, everybody like call your reps and like tell them how you feel about X and Y issue. Um, and we started to think through like, how do we make it much easier for people to reach their elected officials? Because elected officials are on our platforms and people are on our platforms. So how do we help make it easy for them to connect with each other? And how do we do it in meaningful ways? Um, and so that's what that team thought about and we built products like Town Hall, which is live here in the US and in Brazil, uh, which helps you easily find and connect with your elected officials down to the local level. Um, and in one click, give them a call. Uh, so we'll include like their contact information in there. Um, and it also means we work on building products to help people, uh, to remind people when to vote, where to vote during election time, and to help people plan to go vote with their friends. Um, so election time is like a huge time where a lot of people go to social media to share that they've voted, to encourage their friends to vote. So we think through like, how do we help people uh, help each other, like get registered to vote? How do we do peer-to-peer -peer voter registration drives? Um, and so we've built products to do that uh, that have helped millions of people get registered to vote. Um, and so it's been super cool working on this kind of work. It sometimes feels like, I'm in the eye of a, of a storm just because uh, Facebook is the press punching bag. Um, but uh, it's really cool stuff. And prior to this, I was a, a youth delegate at the UN, um, which I, uh, this is before I um, was at Facebook. But the State Department and the UN, they will choose one young person to represent American youth voices at the United Nations. And by some grand, miracle and twisted uh, and, and twist of fate, I got chosen to represent American youth and that was wild because I'm from Bolivia, I immigrated to the US and I was like, how am I going to represent Americans' voices at the UN in conversations with folks like Samantha Power, Ban Ki-moon, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Um, and I turn, immediately turned to social media to uh, talk to as many people as I could, to get peop gather people's opinions, um, and oftentimes to invite other young people to come with me uh, to the UN and to decision-making tables just because I couldn't possibly represent uh, such a diverse set of young people here in the US. Um, and so I've personally used social media to sort of elevate youth voices at decision-making tables. And now working at Facebook to um, build products and build partnerships that are gonna help us all be equipped with the skills and knowledge we need to use a platform like Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger um, as a tool for good. And um, I strongly believe that those platforms and social media can be used for good. Uh, and so that's why I'm there. And I'm pumped to be here and pumped to hear about some of your experiences uh, and to be on a panel with such amazing people. I don't know, I'm so glad you pointed that out, that, that uh, um, social media tools, they're tools, right? They're yeah. value neutral in principle. They can be used for good things and for bad things, right? Yeah. Um, and we obviously, we, when we think about digital technology and change, it begs the question, change, what kind of change? The, the good kind, the bad kind? And mm -hmm. the last session, say, okay, we're not, going to, we're not going to use the word good and bad. But, <clears throat> the, uh, but still, it's, it's, uh, it's important to think first about what's the change that you want and then find the right tools, right? 
Um, uh, what, what do you think, Pia? Yeah, so, um, hi, there's a unicorn in this interview. <laughs> um, <laughs> so sorry, I was like, oh, a little whimsy. Whimsy. Can, I, can I take it home from my daughter? <laughs> like, yeah. I want it. Yeah. All right, sorry about that. I was like, yeah. and I saw it. Um, um, so on that note, um, I'm Pia. <laughs> I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, and I've always worked in politics ever since I finished, um, I don't know, whatever, high school. I think even before college, I was already um, in the organizing and political space, and I did everything from like campaign managing to government to think tanks to, I don't know, you name it. And, um, and, and where I'm coming from is I remember one time I was um, campaign managing for a friend of mine who now is mayor of like this huge city that I helped him um, become mayor of it. And this community organizer was take, took us to this huge barn in the middle of Pilar that it's outside of Buenos Aires, like kind of the semi-poor area outside of Buenos Aires. And so he takes us to this barn and it was stuck up to the ceiling with mattresses and construction materials and stuff like that to, to build homes for folks who don't have a home. Um, and I'm like, great, when are we starting? And he's like, no, no, Pia, I mean, elections are not until next year, right? So we're holding off on using this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so like, it was extremely frustrating for me that I felt that, hang on a second, we have this technology that we're able to study in places that we're never gonna set foot at. We can fundraise from folks around the world that we're never gonna meet. Um, we can engage in conversations with people in like, hundreds of different you know, countries and places and experiences and backgrounds, but like, we are limited to voting once every two years. Like, that's the scope of our input in politics. That's like sending an, an emoji, right? Mm -hmm. Like That's the level of, and it blew my mind that this, this was a while ago, right? But it was like 2012, still like already social media was, obviously, um, and the internet was massive. And so I felt that we were like sort of trapped. We were citizens of a century trapped in institutions designed in a different century mm -hmm. and for a different communication technology, right? The time that, and you know, this better than, than anyone here probably, but by the time our institutions were developed at the political institutions that rule our life, the communication technology was ink and paper and a horse, mm -hmm. right? That's how we communicated. Um, and so it made sense at the time, absolute sense, that we built political institutions where the few made decisions in the name of the many, because the many didn't have access to make those decisions, didn't have access to the um, information, education, physically. We couldn't be physically in the same space, right? We couldn't even get to those cities in time to vote um, or to have a, a voice. But that changed radically, and our political institutions have not adapted to the society that we have today. And folks, the, the institutions are not created in a void. They respond to a certain society. They respond to a certain existing technology that was in place where those institutions, um, when those institutions were designed. And um, I, I believe firmly that we need to adapt and evolve the type of, of political institutions we have today for the technology that we have, for the society that we have, for who we are, how we express ourselves, how we organize. Um, and so with that framework is how we started the NET Party, El Partido La Red, the political party. We started developing technology for democracy. We built different open source platforms for civic engagement. Um, and what was fascinating about that was we were creating technology for democracy in Buenos Aires. We wanted folks to be able to um, vote how they would like their representatives to vote. We, we wanted to be able to offer um, ourselves uh, a way to be part of the decision-making process of democracy on a regular basis and not once every couple of years, right, when we are called to say yay or nay to a whole system. Um, and um, and one, I remember one day was like, I don't know, January 2013, and one of the developers that was working with me sends me an email and he's like, hey, do you recognize this? And it was our software being used in Tunisia to debate the constitution. Like someone had grabbed it, translated it into French and Arabic, and they were using it to debate the, for the constitutional debate in Tunisia. And I was, like, my mind was blown away. Like, like there was this emerging need in society around the world to have better tools for democracy and civic engagement. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, say that I, I come from the same generation of activists as, as well. Like I studied my activism around 
like 2011, um, we were super naive. Like, I'm, I'm just gonna be super honest, we were very naive. We thought that social media was this amazing tool that we were gonna use to bring voices into the system that before couldn't have a place. And we really deeply believed that this was a, a proper avenue for change. I think we didn't realize that what social media is, is it's, it's all of that, but it's also designed for the viral spreading of information that optimizes for engagement because the model is advertising, right? We didn't see that coming, right? So we, we kind of, I don't know, in a way we were trying to push civic debate into a tool that was designed for viral advertising, the viral spreading of information. And you know what, like what spreads faster is like what makes us angry, right? Like nothing spreads faster than outrage, nothing, mm. nothing. So social media wasn't created for, for, for um, um, mature, cool debate. It was created for virality. And so we are kind of stuck in this situation now that, and I don't have the answer, um, just spoiler alert, I have no idea, but like we are stuck in this situation where we, we need to, to rethink what our, what our tools are for democracy. And, and more than that, I think at a greater scale, and this is like what I'm, I'm working on, is like we need to think what democracy, what is great democracy for us, right? What, what does great democracy look like for you? Uh, because if we keep saying that this is not what we want, but we are utterly unable to crystallize an alternative, the only thing that we're doing is we're creating power vacuums. And, and politics abhors vacuums. They don't stay empty. Someone else is gonna fill that up. The demagogue that's there, the military, right? The already kind of radical organized group, th those are the ones who step in because they're already organized. We need to think, if this is not what we want, then what, what, what do we want? Do you know? If this is not the democracy that we like, then what is great democracy for us? That's what I wanna leave you with. Thank you. And the, uh, um, you all this morning did some, uh, some great community work, right? Um, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, digital technology involved with it. There was technology involved with that work, right? You were uh, weeding, you were painting, there was all kinds of tools that you were using. You got a lot done for those communities, probably had community members coming out saying hello and, uh, and maybe even working with you. But, uh, but it was very physical, you know, it comes down to it's like the, with, with the mattresses in, in the warehouse, there are physical things that require uh, um, oh, uh, ancient technology to pick up and move around, mm. right? Um, <clears throat> and, and yet we have also at the same time these, these new tools. To the extent that they're abused, they may, uh, uh, it's, it's, it may be a component of the tool itself. It may be, as you point out, exposing weaknesses in our own systems mm. that actually we own. The tools don't own that. If we have problems with populism and problems with corruption, that's our issue. Others may exploit that with the social media tools, but that's actually not the tool's fault, right? They're exploiting a weakness uh, within ourselves. Um, so Doug, you've dealt with uh, um, these kinds of complex environments from a development perspective, right? Um, and, uh, and in particular, you're, uh, uh, you've had some interesting experience with, uh, uh, with, with dairy and, and, uh, um, and, and agriculture, right? How do you see you know, a very physical uh, um, industry, right, um, uh, and uh, and the digital technologies. How do you bring these old and new things together to 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 create and empower and and uh, and move social change in a positive way? Yeah, I think some of it's about adoption um, and knowing when and how appropriate adoption happens. Uh, so thanks to the precinct, um, always putting on phenomenal programs for people around the world and for inviting us here. The spring of my last semester in grad school, I was looking for jobs. And so I went into an interview and they asked me about this thing called the World Wide Web. <laughs> to which I boldly said, yes, I do have an electric mail address. <laughs> and they were in awe. It was AOL. Now I've dated myself, right? And in the interview they said, well, what do you know about databases? And I said, it's amazing. 
You take data, you put it in a database, you can mix it up and get it out. <laughs> I have no idea why they hired me. <laughs> but this demonstrates the problem we have both in the social and in the development sector, which is that we're always behind on the tech front, right? Because the main innovation is happening, to be honest with you, in the consumer spaces and in the digital company spaces. Ten years after that, I found myself senior web strategist for a, a web company. And I went in to see a client, and I was working with them on developing, uh, again, a data system uh, for their company. And the guy on the other side of the table literally said, I want some of that Java stuff. I read about it in a magazine. It's amazing. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you want to do with the Java stuff? He's like, I don't know, but I got to have some of it. <laughs> and we charged him for that Java stuff, let me tell you. <laughs> again, it was an NGO. Again, behind the curve bar, ball. And again, trying to catch up based on whatever it is McKinsey published six months ago. And I think this is one of the challenges, and I think that that's been reiterated by my colleagues, is that in the development sector and in the social impact sector and in, in the political specter, sector to a degree, we're always trying to catch up because we don't have the innovation mindset or we don't want to spend the money or we don't have the money to actually do the types of innovation required to be disruptors. And so by the time we're starting to adopt what we think is disruptive, it's really not disruptive anymore. And I think that's a real challenge that we have. Um, Admiral Mull yesterday in the opening reminded us that social media is shaping the public debate. But I think for too many of us, we think it's because the social media is shaping the public debate, not that the social media is or should be an agnostic platform by which these debates are happening from others. And when we understand that those debates are coming from others on these platforms, I think what we're gonna realize is they're have always been these extreme voices. None of us can be shocked about that. If anything, social media has democratized voice and it has flushed them out into the public. The challenge is how it is that we're managing those voices and how it is that we set an expectation for each other and the platforms themselves to say, this is wrong and this is right if we expect those platforms to be agnostic. Now, fortunately, I think what we're seeing is more and more corporations, and it's largely because investors in technology are calling for this, are saying there is a right and a wrong. We are moving away from the idea that there are agnostic platforms towards what is an internet social norm. It's emerging, it is not pretty, and it is not clean but it is evolving just like the conversations themselves are. And I think that's the challenge that I would put for each of you, is how it is that you help to not do what NGOs have done in the past or, or political organizations have done in the past, which is chasing after the Java, but instead figuring out how it is to leverage the technology where it makes sense to actually provide access, and to elevate and to activate voices so we have a much more common, a much more cohesive, even if it's full of disagreement, a much more cohesive conversation. Um, and we may find that that's not possible, and that's okay. Yeah, I, I think it, a couple of things the, that, that I really heard there. Uh, one is, is uh, to concentrate first on the change, not the technology, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the, the real disruptors are those who are thinking about that social change that they want to make. That's the disruption, actually. It's not about the technology. You know, Facebook is in the business of technology disruption, right? Um, but not, uh, well, maybe they used to be. But anyway, the, but, uh, uh, but this is a room full of social disruptors, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the technology is an, the enabling device, right? And as long as you're focused on that, then the tools will come, right? Um, and when and where they're appropriate, keep your minds open and talk to the right people. Um, but the other thing in, in talking about, you know, we will learn, and I think uh, another side of that is that those who would seek to uh, um, confuse and distort um, and influence, they also learn 
right? That's also a moving target. Um, they get better at it. Um, they get, uh, and, and as uh, there are those who observe and see how easy and cheap it is to be successful, successful some, in some ways at a grand scale, um, you get replication, right? Um, uh, and, and so it's not just one or a couple large state actors, but lots of states and non-states and corporations and small groups of you know, uh, individuals even. And so it, it can get, uh, I think we're only beginning to explore the, uh, the kind of challenging environment that, that we will face in, in that space. But uh, um, now it's time to turn it all to you all. Yes, lots of hands. That's exactly where I wanted to be. All right, let's start in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Finn. Um, I'm one of the Virginia hosts. Um, I just finished writing my senior thesis on the effect of deplatforming on digital far right extremists. So, as you imagine, I have absolutely no opinions on this topic whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did actually uh, just want to provide some resources that I stumbled across in the course of writing this thesis. Uh, that if you all are interested in reading more about this topic, I just kind of wanted to put them out there. Um, Two in particular. There is a really great report by Data and Society, which is a think tank um, that writes about technology and the public sphere, among plenty of other things. It's called the Alternative, or the Alternate Influence Network. Um, and what she does is she looks at this network of far-right influencers on YouTube in particular, how they're cross-networking, how they're cross-referencing each other, how they're creating this cohesive group online that responds to each other draws strength from each other, uses these platforms in order to get their message heard, um, amplifies the more extreme voices in their group. Um, so that was uh, the Alternate Influence Network uh, by uh, Rebecca Lewis for Data and Society. And there's also this amazing book called Twitter and Tear Gas um, uh, by Zeynep Tufeki. She's a Turkish activist, um, writes about these issues. She's a scholar on she writes about the Arab Spring. She writes about how Facebook has been used in recent years, um, kind of how Facebook versus Twitter was able to amplify um, the Ferguson protests, how that was only able to come up on Twitter because the structure of Twitter responded better to that particular crisis than Facebook. And she amplifies this really important point that I would argue that these platforms are not content neutral. They're not just tools. They're algorithms. They make conscious choices about what kind of content they want to promote what kind of content they don't want to promote. Uh, there's no dislike button on Facebook, and that impacts what kind of content we see. Um, and I think it's really important that we understand these are not content neutral platforms. They are platforms, they are where our public sphere is, but they're not content neutral. So when people are using these platforms, they need to understand that. Um, yeah, that's my two cents, I guess. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks. And, and I, I hope that uh, um, as, as each of you have, have resources that, uh, um, that the precinct also maybe in, in terms of its continuing social uh, uh, networking of you all, even maybe can curate uh, a bunch of resources uh, that, that might be available to, to support folks as, as they continue on and contribute, each of you I hope would also contribute to that, uh, that resource list as, uh, as we go forward. Sorry, I'm giving you action items. That's not, that's not. <laughs> more, more hands. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Joe Reeves. Um, I'm a Virginia host. I'm a student here at UVA. Um, my my question is is it's I'm particularly excited about your response, Nicole. But it's almost just to respond to Pia and Doug's comments because um, I find it fascinating how technology is evolving, specifically with big data analytics and algorithms, um, and a lot of the aspects of the first comment. Um, I guess my question is, is you know, and I also just to add on to that, but like how that impacts civic society, specifically reflecting on the 2016 election in America with the profitability and perpetuation of false news on social media platforms and how algorithms are built to kind of perpetuate self-confirmation bias where you see more of that same content despite its validity. Um, but these algorithms are also driven by profit motivations. Mm -hmm. It keeps users on the websites longer and that's good for the business of Facebook. So where's the equilibrium point between civic responsibility and validity, but then also maintaining like the business fundamental of driving profitability? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there we have, that I have the perfect answer to this. Um, and I definitely think that we do have a responsibility um, as a platform 
uh, to sort of understand like how is it that we can um, show people the content that you know is important to them but also give them the power to say like I don't want to see this anymore in my news feed or if I see an ad a political ad I want to know where it's coming from who's paying for it who else they're targeting so that you can make informed decisions about the things that you you do um, and so I think we have a responsibility to you know, show people the content that they like, um, give people ads that are tailored to their interests so that you're not seeing random ads that you don't care about, um, which sustains our business and enables us to provide a service that is free to people um, and, you know, that anyone can use regardless of the amount of income you have. And then two, to build tools that, to build tools that help with transparency. So building apps, transparency tools that help you understand like, who, um, you know, who's paying for an ad, and then also, you know, who else they're targeting, which is, I think, important information, um, and launching those tools in place, especially around election time. Um, and then also understanding, like, you know, testing out new methods, whether it's third-party fact-checking, whether it's how do we, and exploring questions to answers like, to exploring answers to questions like, who decides what's uh, right or wrong or what is misinformation? Um, should it be our platform? Should we leave that to third party fact checkers? Should we have kind of like a, um, a collective way that the community on Facebook can help us identify that? And I think that's a lot of the stuff we're exploring at Facebook. Um, and that I, you know, I do, and that we hire many professors and researchers to come and help us understand like what are the best ways that we can both um, show people ads that they care about so that we keep the service free, but also that we're protecting uh, uh, our people on our platform in a way that makes sense. So I think a lot of things to explore, but those are some of the ways that Facebook is sort of looking into, um, into doing this kind of stuff. You, you come from a very different kind of business model. How do you find that equilibrium where you have a successful business where at the same time uh, finding that balance with social responsibility and, and transparency? It's very, it's tough. Um, so Open Collective is my company, um, which has nothing to do with democracy. That's a foundation that I started called Democracy Earth, um, which is a full and non-profit. I also started a company which I now run, it's called Open Collective, and it has a different business model, I think, than advertising. So I think that, so the, the kind of the fine line that we walk is that we have investing investors, and it's obviously the fine line that every company um, walks. You have shareholders, and and part of the problem is that, in at least in the United States, the role of a corporation is to maximize profit for your shareholders. That's that's your object. That's what you should do. And I, as a CEO of my company, I am hold to that mm -hmm. standard, which I think is a it's, it's complex because when you talk about social issues or when you start working in the social space, there are things that you want to do that might not you know, go towards the growth of your company, and, but you still think that the right thing to do. And like, I guess that part of my job as, as CEO is making sure that I take the company to a place where we have the independence to make those decisions um, without having to have all, to respond to the bottom line only. Um, but my, my, thank you, but my, um, I think that the, the, when it comes to fake news and the spread of misinformation and the, mo the, the business model of the internet is advertising. So with absolutely all the love in the world, and let, until we change that, nothing really matters. Because that's just, that's, the business model of the internet. So Facebook, with all respect, can try and put in place all the civic initiatives that they want, but their business model is advertising. They make money out of you staying engaged with Facebook and selling your data to advertisers or selling your profile to advertisers. That is the model, and not only of Facebook, it's the, the business model of the internet in general. Um, so until that changes, um, 
I don't think we're going to, I think we're only going to see more spread of misinformation and um, virality and whatever drives engagement. And as, as I think I said before, like, in, uh, you know, what drives engagement is outrage and being upset about things. And I, yeah. um, so what's going to happen with the internet? I don't know. There are a lot of really interesting fringe projects happening around with Web3, the decentralized space, the crypto space, um, offline social media, like um, the Scuttlebutt Consortium, Maniverse. There are a lot of super interesting projects that are now trying to think, right, what is the next web? Because the one that we, we have took us here, which is great, and it has at the base layer a lot of open protocols, but it doesn't have open protocols for things that are key, that are identity, for example, or, um, and so it's just how it's built, it's an infrastructure problem. Um, and I think that we, we need to support, engage with, start, fund the projects that are building the next web. And what does that look like? And how we have open protocols for identity, how we have like personal APIs, right? Where like, you, you know, the services engage with me in my terms, my data is my, it's mine, I sell it as I want, and I make profit of others using my data if I, I wish to, instead of me as an individual having to go and connect with all these different APIs in, the, in their terms, in the services terms. Um, like that's what I wanna see in the world, and um, yeah. But again, until we get there, we're gonna see fake news. <coughs> that's just, I'm sorry, I don't have a, <laughs> I wish I had a more optimist answer because I am at my core, I'm, I am an optimist, but I think that my responsibility is to be fully transparent with what I really think, so. Yeah, um, I, I mean, just to yeah. add to that, I mean, yeah, I don't foresee us as Facebook solving the fake news problem. Um, and in fact, I think there's a lot to be done, which is my job, you know, now at Facebook in civic education, I think there's a lot to be done for like, uh, our education systems to catch up and teach young people how, do you, how technology can be used and misused um, so that when you encounter fake news or when you, you know, encounter things on, our, on the platforms, you uh, are at least informed on how to engage with them. Um, and so I think that's... I mean, there's a totally fantastic model that is Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia is like a fantastic model. It's a source of truth. Like when I was in college or you know, in school, like quoting Wikipedia on a school paper was like, you know, <laughs> bye bye, see you later. Yeah. Now like Wikipedia is like the source of it's truth. Source. It's amazing, yeah. and yeah. like it's, a, it's a, it is, it is, it is, and it's been like it's crowdfunded, and you post fake some things that is fake there, and people voluntarily take the time to go and edit and add quotes and add resources, and they take out like they weed out misinformation. Of course, it's underfunded. It doesn't have advertising. It's not perfect. It doesn't have a business model. So that's a, that's a problem. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's why it is what it is, right? But um, yeah, mm -hmm. the, I think that, um, anyway. Yeah, I just worry about what, I, it, I know, you feel out with the source of truth, but, but the I get truth why. Thing is, but the, wait, but part yeah. of it, so, I, so I've worked a lot in politics, um, admittedly, and Wikipedia, you can go, and the way it's just wide open for editing, I mean, you can go on and you can more than tweak with someone's Wikipedia profile. It's gonna get changed in two seconds. And it two doesn't necessarily get, get changed reverted. in two seconds. Mm. <laughs> and I think this is, you know, so this is the challenge we have. I that, challenge you to that. We're gonna do this, I'm gonna so, email everyone. I'm gonna, so we're half gonna the room is now logged on and we're all <laughs> editing Doug's profile right so now. I, I, I will do that. <laughs> So I, I think there's, you know, part of the challenge is um, both of you have hit on is this, the, the truth, though. Um, on the topic of resources, the Hewlett Foundation has done some really groundbreaking work on truth and media around some of these issues. And I think that they are really leading some of the research charge on how it is that we grapple with this. And you're right, part of it is teaching people to start weeding out mm what is likely not true and what, what is possibly true. But you do have to, you do have to filter these things. Yeah. Right. And, and some of it's even more nefarious than, than alternate uh, uh, visions or alternate truths, as, as some have, uh, have suggested. But, but actually, uh, the systematic destruction of truth itself, yes. right? So it's, it's yes. thousands of alternate narratives so that 
the, that one true, that more fact, empirically based narrative is just lost within the thousands. Mm. Yep. It's a weaponization of postmodernism, right? Um, and when nothing is true, then anything is possible. You can, you can slide through, sneak through. Uh, mm. So uh, could we get the mic over here too? Where is where? Oh, gee, I don't, yeah. Thank you, my name is Joshua, uh, Alaska fellow from Uganda. So human beings, we are prone to making mistakes every day of our life. And um, these mistakes, over time, we, we realize like the mistakes we do, and we correct them. And that means like someone who meets me today, you might meet a better version of me, like compared to whoever met me last year. It's because over time we evolve and we keep changing, we realize the mistakes we do. Challenge is that sometimes when we share the information we share, yeah, this information sticks. So what I shared in January last year might be still there, and I've shared a lot of things maybe about myself, and over time, as I'm changing, I'm evolving into a better person, I, I begin sharing good stuff about me, but at the end of the day, these records of you from the past, technology has captured them. And we've seen over time, like yeah, in my country, I've interacted with some people in HR. They go ahead and judge people based on what they used to post when they were in high school, when they're so excited about life, like when they're reckless about what they say. But somebody has changed. Unfortunately, somebody is missing a job because the HR believe that on such and such a time, this guy posted this and this. What did he mean? And so you don't know the persons right now. Maybe this has changed over time. And so my question is, like, how do we take care of like, uh, this maybe unintended consequences that maybe social media uh, uh, has maybe imposed on, on people? So you have a room full of aspiring political activists here who are now really concerned about their, the, uh, what they posted, um, uh, social media when they were 16, 17 years old, and their frontal cortex hadn't evolved as, uh, as, as far as it has now. Um, some control issues maybe. Uh, and they're nervous. So, how, so it's a very practical, meaty, like real problem for aspiring politicians that can, in fact, filter people, filter great quality people out uh, of, of activism of politics because of silly stuff that they did before. How do yeah. we deal with it? I deleted all my tweets when I run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before I run. Yeah, so all your tweets were deleted. Okay. But yeah, I went back and I'm like, all right, this is gone, this is going, this is going, this is going. Did it work? You're like, maybe. Yeah, I did, the, I did the work. But I mean, uh, the, again, I, when I ran, it was 2013. So, okay. like, you know, it, A, I didn't have that many tweets. Um, although I, I've been in the platform since 2007, so I had a fair bit of tweets. <laughs> and B, um, it was a different, again, it was a different time. Like, yeah, that's. Yeah. what I did. But I think there is not a project of the right to be forgotten or mm -hmm. something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, where you can, I mean, yeah, you can go and like go back many years and start deleting your stuff. But there's, I think this is like a really important mm. thing to touch. I'm really happy you asked this because we often, when we think about our politicians, we like expect them to be perfect and to like have never like taken a, a photo in college with like a red cup, like drinking a drink. And it's like, no, like we all did that in college. like relax like we cannot expect our politicians to consistently be absolutely perfect and we're not going to vote for someone just because of a tweet they said in you know 2013 hmm. like we just need to recognize that politicians are regular people and like we can be a part of changing that conversation and changing the expectations we set in our politicians politicians are like everyday people just like us hmm. they should be going there to represent us it doesn't mean that they are perfect and we need to sort of you know, we, we can expect a lot of our politicians, but it, it shouldn't be that we have to like expect them to be absolutely perfect and to have never had a drink in college. You know, it's like we need to be a part of changing that conversation and um, making it okay. And so it's like, you know, it's interesting now. I, I see employers sort of changing that. I don't know what it's like in other countries, but like, for example, when I applied for jobs out of college, uh, no one, I mean, I had many photos up on Facebook of me at a college party and like, I wasn't being asked about them and I'm really happy about that because we were all in college once or we were, we all said something dumb on the internet once and we just need to like relax about it. And I understand that it's very hard to tell your HR person this, um, but you know, as we like grow older and as we are creating society, let's just like all understand that we're like changing and evolving humans mm -hmm. and that, um, and even with politicians, like we can't expect, we shouldn't like completely um, dismiss 
a politician because of what because of a tweet they said many many years ago mm -hmm. and understand that our perspectives are changing and that we are changing people mm -hmm. and we just need to be more compassionate with each other yeah I, I might not be ready to go that far <laughs> uh, because I live in Virginia and <laughs> This thing, this social media thing called yearbooks happened to us uh, with our governor. All right. All right. Right, where he couldn't tell you whether he was the guy in blackface or the guy in the hood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to go quite that far, but I think, Aaron, the, the issue that you raised okay. was actually really important, which is it's dissuading people like you from going into politics. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst thing that could happen for our representative democracy, both here and abroad, is we need the infusion of idealism, we need the infusion of people who are willing to, to make mistakes, yeah. and we need the infusion of your energy in politics. We need each of you thinking about how it is that you're involved in the process, mm -hmm. because otherwise it's going to be relegated to the extremes and the extremes with money. Mm. And that's why, I, that's why I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add, though, to that? Guys, take care of yourselves and girls. Like, it's, if you're going to run, it's tough. Mm -hmm. And like, sure, it's all fun and games until it's your face out there and it's people calling you those things. And it's like people bringing out from your history, you know, like digging into it. Just, I mean, it's not rosy. And it, just, just be very mindful of um, how you're feeling always. Make sure that you're... You're taking care. I mean, I think it's public service and running. That's what I do. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything else. But I also would, would very much ask you to take care of yourselves and make sure that you're willing to do that. And it's not, yeah. And maybe delete some pictures if you can. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, share what you're comfortable with. Go back and delete things. But, yeah. More Makes questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Sofia. I'm from El Salvador. Uh, we just recently had an election, and our elected president is, is it's a disruptive president. He only communicates via Twitter. Mm. I think it's something that's happening here in the U.S. as well. Or <laughs> every, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's been a, a disruptive election in El Salvador because he didn't even show for the presidential debates. He made uh, a presidential monologue at the same time that the presidential debate was taking place. He never uh, shows up to press conferences. He only goes on Facebook Live and has his own monologue. He's, he's actually never been present uh, bef before a public. Uh, so it's, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's changing the way of politics in my country. And so, actually, my question to you is, do you think that there's a thing as too much technology mm. uh, that's taking place right now? Or should we expect this from now on? Or should we stick to some conventional practices that have been taking place so far and uh, I I ask him to, to, to stick to that or just let him do, let him do his thing and you just be OK with it? I don't know, maybe your president's a hologram and doesn't exist. Uh, but generally speaking, technology is not going away. Um, artificial intelligence is rising. Uh, machine learning is rising. Um, the companies that are making the most money in the digital space, 70% of them are investing heavily uh, in AI already. So I, the technology, the question is, is there ever too much it's, it's probably, in my opinion, it's sometimes misused or you throw different technology at something just for the sake of technology, but I don't, I don't think technology is going away and we have to figure out, as people who are activating around social justice and social issues, we have to figure out how we're going to leverage it mm -hmm. and not be scared of it. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to figure out how to invest in it so we're not always catching up. Yeah, and also like San Francisco, for example, now it's a great example. They just voted to um, 
to not have facial recognition on in San Francisco on the streets. I live in New York, and I, you know, my face is all over the freaking whatever. I don't know who's watching, but like <laughs> that's like that's not even a question, right? And in San Francisco, it's like banned. So um, you you have that, you have New York, and then you have China, right? And the like social score system and, and all of that jazz. So um, I think you have different levels of of. Uh, I don't think we should lose the fact that we have agency on that. I think that we do have agency. And, and I mean, there is like this tension between the land and the cloud, essentially, like right, governments and, and, and digital companies. And in this tension, I think we as citizens can, can actually have a certain level of impact. And I wouldn't forget about that, right? Um, it requires organizing, it requires activism, it requires investing our time, our voices, our, um, funds but yeah i think it is a battle that we can give yeah i mean i also think so you know i there is this we so like for example technology can be used to enhance a lot of things um in the offline world right whereas like here for example my city council meetings i live in oakland california and i can't attend any of the city council meetings because they all happen at like 2 p.m when like we're all at work, like who is attending those meetings? Yeah. Like, and so it's like, um, I'm gonna need you to like record it so I can watch it later at some point so that I can be somewhat informed on what's happening in, in my community. Mm -hmm. So I think in those cases it's like hugely, it like gives access to people that like are working and like don't have the luxury to like step out of work at 2 p.m. to go listen to your city council members to debate an issue that's important and that affects you. Um, I also think it can be used to like really inform people. And I think the biggest thing here is like you're mentioning like, you know, our president refuses to debate on, on live TV and that sucks because then you're not able to accurately compare two candidates, right? And, but he's off going, doing monologues on Facebook Live. I think a lot of this is, it comes down to like, how do we invest in people and educate them on like, how to, um, one, turn out to vote, why it's important to turn out to vote, why it's important to look at what's happening and understand like, oh, like he refuses maybe to go on debates because X, Y, and Z reasons, he doesn't want to answer X, Y, and Z questions, uh, and give people the power to be able to choose who they elect into office. I think what's interesting is we're seeing oftentimes like a lot of surveys say that people trust less in democracy. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, um, it comes down to like, how do we help teach people, whether it's in schools or outside of schools, uh, that they have a sense of agency to be able to look at information and make a choice. And like, they have the responsibility to the public good and to go out and vote uh, so that we're choosing people that are responsible and that we believe accurately represent us. Mm. Um, so, you know, there is a time and place for technology, and I think technology can be used in many powerful ways to give more access to tables that we're not a part of. Uh, but I think in, in this case, a lot of what I would say is like, we just, we need to do better in investing in education and teaching people how to, disem how to understand information and be able to use it to be able to exercise your vote and your voice. I'd, I'd also just suggest that uh, what you just described is frankly ridiculous, right? Um, it's, it's funny. Make fun of it, right? Um, maybe, so, so have physical events uh, uh, where in fact you have a cutout of your president yeah? or, or, or a hologram, right? Um, uh, and, 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 and make it so that the he, he loses either way, right? He shows up and looks ridiculous because maybe he's just awkward uh, in, in, uh, in public settings. He doesn't show up and he looks ridiculous because uh, He's a, a, a paper cutout, right? Mm. Um, so I may make it a lose-lose situation through humor, right? Mm. Uh, make fun of him, uh, ridicule him, right? In this, in this sort of sh expose how ridiculous that scenario is that he's presenting, um, and 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 then you'll sort of you'll begin to uh, to crack open that that sense of invulnerability of the monologue, right? Um, I think we have time for one more. Is that right? Or mm. no. Yeah, OK, quick one and, I'm and sorry, then folks. So light, lightning round. My fault. Quick question. Uh, yes, right there, right behind. Yeah. Um, so I would like to ask, should we be widening the net of accountability? Because we talk about technology for social change, and 
um, technology has opened up, you know, ridiculous opportunities for uh, programmers and creators of, of programs and even PR firms when you think about social media and the content they create. Uh, but I find that there is not accountability for the creators, even though they're being maybe fed the content. Uh, do you feel that there should be some amount of accountability? Because I'll give you what's happening in my country right now. Um, we had a no confidence motion against our government and the elections was actually supposed to happen in March. I'm from Guyana, by the way. So the opposition party um, hired a controversial PR firm out of the US to lobby for um, you know, fair, fair elections and for the elections to come about as it should according to our, our democracy. But the, um, the current government is arguing that they only did that so that they can have ads um, to increase racial tension and these kind of things. So as a digital marketer, I know that uh, Facebook, for example, has their rules and their terms of agreement and wouldn't or shouldn't allow that. But again, should we, we be widening that net of accountability and not just say, okay, it's this party's or that party's fault. Well, we, we have political parties in my country or uh, the people that are posting the content or utilizing the apps, should we be holding the, the creators also accountable? Who do you mean by the creators? For example, the PR firm who is now oh, going to create the campaigns and um, kind of tell the story. And even if, let's say, they create <coughs> an app of, around what they want their agenda to be, and they're able to use that to influence um, voters and um, just mm -hmm the population? Should there be more accountability on the side of the people that are creating these, um, the technology? Another question I had for you was that who's we, who should, who's we in this like, should we be holding them accountable? Is that the public? Is that the government? Is that social media sites? Do you have a perspective? Well, I think from you being from Facebook, from you being, um, from Facebook, would you ever like hold a PR uh, firm accountable, or do you? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, big, the, the biggest thing we do in this case when you're running ads on Facebook in the lead up to an election, uh, there's a requirement for a, you have to show that you're a real person and not a bot, so you get a, our ad transparency tools asks you, ask you to send a photo of your ID by mail, and it's this whole like really complicated process if you want to run ads in the lead up to an election. And then we provide uh, transparency to people so that you guys can see who else these ads are being targeted to. Uh, so when you click the three dots next to an ad, you will see information on how much money they're spending, who they're targeting um, with this ad. And I think ultimately what's most important is for us to give people that information so that you can make your own choices. I don't think we should be the ones telling you what's right or wrong. Um, and I think it is our responsibility to be, uh, to build the tools to help you make decisions. Um, and I also, I also think government has a role to play in this. And in regulating, you know, the kind of ads that people can run on, on anywhere, not just Facebook, um, in the lead up to elections. So I think it's a multi-actor, like a lot of people, we, we should be held accountable for building the tools to help you, to give you the information you need to be able to make smart choices. Um, but I think government is also involved. I think society should also be involved in, in, in holding that accountable. Makes sense. Hey, you got anything? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that they should be, obviously I think they should be held accountable. I think that there are rules and regulations that hold them accountable. Like if you uh, and governments should enforce them, like you shouldn't be able, I don't know, in Argentina, for example, uh, you know, three or four days before the election, you can't campaign anymore, mm -hmm. right? But you couldn't put advert, like ads on TV and on the street, but like no one thought about social media. Like, so you could still put ads on Facebook or comments on Facebook or whatever, at Twitter, um, during the day of the election, which is crazy, right? So like those things, I think, obviously, um, should be um, enforced and taking, a, you know, um, we should hold them accountable. Um, also, where the money's coming from, if, if, if there are rules that prevent foreign money from 
um, being spent in an election locally, that the, the money trail should be followed. And you know, those spending the money wrongly should be accountable. And those taking the money should also be held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think generally propaganda has been around in the political space forever. And so I would agree that I actually don't think the platforms are gonna be able to hold the content producers um, responsible. But for anyone wanting to create a company out there, uh, a third party app that's essentially a bullshit meter yeah. that's based on a bot that responds in real time based on machine learning, you probably have a pretty good business there. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's it's a big else. problem, right? There's, there's, there are folks out there, there are lots of ideas, but there's plenty of room for it, right? Um, so yeah, or, or a company that would keep a registry of uh, PR companies who pays them what the content is that they produce for whom, not just in your country, but globally, because if they're doing it badly in your country, they're probably doing it badly in other places as well. Um, uh, but at the same time, they probably want an account with Coca-Cola, right? Um, but uh, um, and uh, and and so on the other hand, so you can transparency can be a tool for uh, at least indirect accountability, right? Um, uh, the, in that way, there's the market can impose some discipline on behavior. Um, it's it's counterintuitive in a way, but but it, you know, there there are there are angles, there are ways. But that's another uh, business opportunity for for someone out here somewhere. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I know there are lots of questions. Some of us will be able to hang out a little bit longer. Um, uh, unfortunately, some of us have to, to run, but uh, you can find us all online um, and through the, uh, uh, through the social media platforms that are made available to you all. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there and in your own physical material, very real places. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.